Welcome to the scriptorium. Last time we were talking about book design, and in this program, number 18, we continue with this plate number 20 on book design. And let's look at the rectangle with which we stopped last time, this root three. This is the root two one, and this is the root three one. Now, <coughs> notice that this uh, root sign is actually an italic R, based on the italic R. Now, if this is one, you, uh, you double that, and then take the square root of it, and that is the, uh, the, the uh, proportional relationship, one to 1.414. However, you don't have to worry about that any more than you do that the square root of three is 1.732. Uh, just just uh, put these diagonals up and then make these new rectangles. Now, a root four, of course, would be just twice this square. And a root five, you think, well, how tall that would be. That wouldn't be very practical for a book design. But here is a root five book, a very charming one, uh, a book of uh, Mother Goose Tales. And believe me, I'd, I used this when my boys were little. To have a wriggling five-year-old on your lap is a very handy book to hold. Uh, and you can read it to him and uh, keep it out of the way of his arms and legs. So the, all of these curious rectangles have their uses, and there are many of them. Now, <coughs> there is the three by four, uh, which is very popular with people designing books of poetry. And we have here a, a contemporary book of poetry, which is in the old style of the three by four or quarto design. And uh, another one is a quarto. So the three by four uh, rectangle is a very popular one, especially in regard to poetry. I find that it's the only rectangle which makes the sonnet look really good. And the sonnet is, is aw awfully uh, short for its width. And uh, it's hard to find a rectangle which will make a sonnet look good. Now, to get a really handsome, a really handsome design, let's uh, see what this canon is that was uh, developed in the Middle Ages, not used exclusively by all designers, but it's amazing how many of them apparently knew the shop practice of the canon and used it. So I've taken a rectangle here made up of two uh, two golden section rectangles. And by the way, the golden section rectangle has the proportions of eight, uh, uh, eight five wide, 8.5 high, or 21 by 34. Now, you may wonder how you can remember 21 by 34. Uh, maybe I shouldn't get into this, but this is a fascinating thing. <coughs> a great mathematician in the Renaissance named Fibonacci uh, discovered a series, one, two, three. Now add, see, two and one makes three. Add three and two, five. Five and three, eight. Eight and five, 13. Eight and 13, 21. 21 and 13, 34. And this incredible golden ratio, which is such a beautiful proportional relationship, uh, is too complex. There are books that have been written about that, but you'll find it in Greek architecture, you'll find it in Greek vases, you'll find it in Greek painting, you'll find it in Roman imitations of the Greek, and in much Renaissance art. But if you don't remember the, the ratio of 21 to 34, just use the Fibonacci series by counting to three and then adding uh, each number with the previous one, and you can arrive at the 21 by 34. Now let's see this incredible formula that was discovered by Chichold. He, he had the cue from a manuscript book from the late Middle Ages of an architect, a Parisian architect. You draw the diagonals. Uh, these are two pages, by the way. Uh, William Morris discovered in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance that the two pages were used as a unit, not one page. Now here is the the beginning of our book, and the gutter is in here. That is the mid part of the book. Two pages. But let's 
take by, at this center, let's draw a diagonal to the outer corners. And with a hard pencil, for accuracy, you can get what you're seeking. Now that is nothing to frighten the student. Uh, that should be pulled. But we're ready now to find out what the margin should be. Let me get this paper straightened up. <coughs> Start here at this intersection. And what we're working toward is this intersection over here. So that's very simple, isn't it? There should be nothing to frighten anybody there. So erect a perpendicular from this intersection up until it, it cuts the head of the book. This top is called the head. Now, focus your eyes on that intersection and connect that intersection at the top with this intersection over here. Now, the incredibly wonderful thing about all this is that now we have our head margin, which is this. We have our gutter margin, which is this. And uh, notice what happens when we draw horizontals and verticals through those points and the intersections which come as a result. Come on, straighten up there, mister. Now, there's our top margin. By the way, in doing this work, use drafting tape. I don't want to stop to put it on. It takes too long. We don't have much time. But where this horizontal intersects that long diagonal, drop a perpendicular, this is our side margin. Now, where that intersects the, the, the top diagonal here, draw a horizontal. Make sure I have this level here. And this is the bottom margin. Now, the inner margin, the margin in the gutter, is found by just dropping a perpendicular from that place. Now, here, there we have a, a, a next-visit rectangle for a text area. And the margins, you see, have been determined very quickly very quickly. And this can be used on any rectangle. It can be used on a square. And you'll get a text area, which is approximately the Renaissance ideal of being practically 50% of the page area. Now, you may think that it's really larger than that, but it's unbelievable how these margins add up, because they add up very rapidly. Here is a book which Jan Schichel designed. It, uh, and if we uh, cut off the running head up here, this rectangle is actually only 62% of the total area. Well, how do we determine that? You, you multiply the width of the page by the height to get the total area of the page, then multiply the width of the text by the height of the text, and that gives you the total area of the text. Then divide the area of the total page into the area of the text alone, and that will give you the percentage. And you can find the percentage of any book which you have. This book on the nature of Gothic, published by our local Charles Lehman and designed by Charles Bigelow, uh, both people being ex-students of mine, this book is designed according to this uh, uh, design which I just showed you, this canon as it's called. And the margins here are 43%. Uh, that is, they, they make the text area 43% of the total area. So it's a little under the classic ideal, but it gives you an extremely beautiful uh, page. The margins are the part that you don't get into, and the margins are extremely important in the total design. Well, could we stop now and visit uh, the uh, Montessori School in Vancouver, Washington, to see those children at their work. My name is Mary Skinner, and we're at the Skinner Montessori School in Vancouver, Washington. 
Uh, the children that come to school here are aged from two and a half through the first grade. And we have an italic program that is part of our regular school policy. The children have three different types of exercises that they practice. The first one, before they get into actual writing, they have italic sandpaper letters. And with these exercises, they learn the sound and the name, how many strokes are involved in writing the letter, and whether the letter has an ascender, a body letter, or a descender. The chalkboards are used as a, as a middle exercise for children that are not quite ready for paper. And with the chalkboards, they can erase their mistakes immediately and try and make a new letter. Once they can make letters well on the chalkboards, then we put them on to practice books. These books are uh, sh uh, made up of about 20 sheets of paper that they sew together themselves and decorate. And they're made on the same principle as the chalkboards. And with these books, they practice letters uh, they are corrected. They're not allowed to erase, but uh, the teacher will make a corrected letter next to their letter, and they will try and write uh, a better letter next to the corrected one. When they do these practice books, at each table there is a leader, and the leader is usually a old kindergarten child or a first grader who knows all of the sounds, all of the strokes, and... Uh, does letters well continually, and he will correct the other children. Uh, the equipment is set up so that it all has a control of error in it without a child having to constantly come to a teacher and ask for approval of whether he's, he or she's done it right or wrong. Uh, these children who lead a table uh, follow that Montessori principle by uh, being able to give the children guidance without having to always come to an adult. <coughs> well, it can't be said that we're becoming a nation of illiterates when, if we have classes like that in very many parts of the United States. Uh, it, it's marvelous to see those little children at their, at their work grasping the importance of good letter design and, in time, good page design. <coughs> now let's look at this again. <coughs> As I said before, it's, it's hard to realize that this is close to 50% of the total area. <coughs> uh, in this book of Edward Johnson's, and I doubt if Johnson had anything to do with the actual layout of the pages, but this book seems to have rather generous margins. Uh, but it, in fact, the, uh, the page area is only about, uh, the text area is only about 47% of the total, total page area. This is an extremely important book, this writing and illuminating and lettering. It's been called the Bible of the calligraphers, meaning by Bible, which means book only. Uh, not do, that's not confusing it with the Holy Bible. But uh, Bilbion is the old Greek word for book, and the Bible is an important book. And this is the important book for the uh, people working with letter design. So I would advise you to get a copy of this uh, if you work your way through this course and through my textbook. It's not a book for beginners, but uh, for people who are intermediate or advanced. <coughs> In that author's introduction, Johnson says, the most important use of letters is in the making of books. The most important use in the making of books. Now he speaks of uh, the job opportunities possibly in writing out awards, presentations to, on parchment to be given to board members or vice presidents of corporations or big companies when they retire. And there is quite a bit of that work possible. Uh, in, the, in the Northwest at present, bronze plaques tend to be given more often than uh, awards written out on parchment. But I think if we could demonstrate our ability to do this work, that we would have more work to do on parchment and vellum in calligraphy. Now, only, only uh, lawyers, doctors, and dentists today tend to put such awards in frames and hang them on their walls. And they're on their office walls. Generally, if a person gets an honorary degree, and I've written out many of them for people uh, for any reason whatsoever, 
or an award. He doesn't want it framed and hanging on his uh, living room wall. I think the best solution, and I've used this sometimes, is to design the award in a relatively small size and put it in book form. And if it's in book form, then he can put it on his library shelf, leave it on the table in his library or his living room, and if people want to look at it, there it is. See, if, his, if it stayed rolled up, it's likely to get crushed. And when it gets crushed, then it's, it's, it's ruined, it get dirty. And uh, the thing that if it's in book form, it stays in, in good condition. So let's, uh, let's go on with this. <coughs> what are you going to do with this is a big question. Uh, suppose this, we want to, to use this and we want to put a poem on it. What do we do? We write out the longest line on our poem and we find that it is too long for this or it is too short for it. So what do you do? Do you make another diagram and another one and another one and another one, just guessing all the time? Uh, th that's almost a hopeless approach because you can lose no end of time and become extremely nervous in trying to guess at just what will give you the right text width for the line that you have written. Now, uh, in the last, the last uh, of the plates, which is, uh, are discussed, I've developed what pleased Jan Chichel very much, a, a way of, of starting with your own line. And it's explained here. I used here a, a root two, or, or a two to three rectangle. By the way, the nice thing about the root or about the two to three rectangle, is that the width of the page is also the height of the text. And that's one of the things that makes it a very pleasing uh, relationship. What you want to be sure to have under all conditions is to have the same proportion in the text area that is in the total book page. And you can tell if you have it, this corner up here and this corner down here will be on that diagonal. If they're on that diagonal, obviously the text area is in direct proportion to the page area. So th this will solve one of the most difficult problems regarding getting a beautiful page layout. Now, uh, we want to find out if our longest, how our longest line will work. What we do is design the whole book around our longest line. So before we start in, let's take some measurements. We don't need to use a ruler. We can use the paper strips or the compasses. I have some compasses here if I can find them. Here they are. Now let's take some measurements off on this side. Take the height of the text area and uh, we'll mark that. is the height of the text area. We want the width of the page. Because we have the height of the page here, you see. The width of the page. This is the, the, the width of page. Uh, this was the, the height of the text area. Now, what else do we need? Uh, we need the, uh, the width of the text, don't we? That's the most important one. Well, one of the most important in getting our questions answered. This is the width of text. And it will be, when we get the new design, our line length. And we want to design the book around that length. So let's draw some lines here and uh, see what happens. All measurements taken on this right side of the rectangle will be in direct proportion. proportion. Extend that. That's the height of the page. Now extend the line here, the height of the text. Run it out. 
to extend the width of the page. You see, it's as if you had a straight line running. And the width of the text. This doesn't take long. You have, have your book. Now, all these distances in here are in direct proportion to the distances on that, on that page. Now, suppose we write our line out, and our line is this long. And we want to know what the book design should be that will take that line. <coughs> you, if you have a particular poem, you take the longest line and write it out four or five times in, in the very easy, relaxed manner so that it will be legible and pleasing. And then that becomes your, your, uh, your, your length, as wh which will enable you to start designing the whole book. Well, with that length of line marked vertically over on the left, let's extend a horizontal through that until it intersects our, the line which is an extension of the width of text. Now the wonderful thing, this wonderful thing happens. Draw a vertical through there. Now here will be the new height. This is the height of your new book. And this will be the width of the page of the new book. That is from here to here. This is the height of your new book. This is the width of the page of the new book. And this will be the height of the text here in the new book. And of course, this is your longest line. So what you do then is make a new a new uh, doubling of, a, of the rectangle, which has this height, this page width, uh, and then you, you work this canon on it again with these diagonals and so on, and then you discover exactly the, uh, the margins, and you have all the information that you need for, uh, for your new book, which is based directly on your width of line. Now, if you didn't do this, you would have, you probably would have to make a dozen of these just as guesswork, uh, hoping sooner or later by accident to find one that will exactly suit your line length. And there's no point in wasting time like that. I have what I call a, a perennial pedagogy, and I'm sure that the points, about 15 of them, that they go back to the Paleolithic period. As many of them are that ancient, and they're found all over the world, such as the first point is get the idea, and, I, and then uh, uh, concentrate, then get the feel of it. And once you get the feel of it, let go and get the rhythm of it, and so on. <coughs> well, w one of the later points in this uh, perennial pedagogy, I'd say, would be to learn the right way of doing things. And what is meant by the right way, uh, generally, and, and I'm using this popular terminology, is the traditional way of doing it, the ancient way of doing it. Now you say, well, how about originality? Well, I don't think you should worry about originality. Uh, find, find out the, the way things have been designed, the way they've been made for centuries, especially in the old traditional societies. And then once you've mastered the traditional ways of doing it, once you've mastered the, the old shop practices, then if the situation demands originality, you'll be able to, to probably to find what will solve the, the problem before you. And it may be original. There are none of these rectangles I'd say none, uh, uh, and the canon itself uh, is, not, is not a rule that you have to follow. I would learn it in order to be sure, to learn that you won't make foolish mistakes. And once you've learned it, then you can, uh, can modify it after you've become experienced and after you've become practiced. But don't feel that you have to plunge out into the void at the very beginning. Have ways of working. As Johnson says, master the commonplace. And your first object should be to have something that is readable, that is uh, legible, 
and pleasurably legible, and uh, something that suits the text, that suits the, the copy, and then uh, uh, last of all, he has the requirement of sweet reasonableness, and uh, that, of course, is an old ideal of sweet reasonableness. And this is the way, to, I'd say, to learn uh, any particular craft. Seek the traditional ways, the traditional solutions to the problem, and then if you, uh, if you find that some way of breaking with it will serve your purpose, then break with it. It's not uh, one of the Ten Commandments. It's not a law that you uh, have to bow down before and revere. These are just rules of thumb to help you and give you confidence and ensure that you can do acceptable and beautiful work. <coughs> so try it out. You may find it, uh, read the explanations, which I've tried very hard to make, make uh, clear. Read them carefully and then make these, use the canon and do this problem over and over again, six times if necessary, and then you'll find it's easy. Thank you.